Well, a very good evening to you. It is uh, five minutes past six now and welcome to our fourth and final live panel programme, What Matters Most. Over the last four weeks, we've discussed uh, preservation and heritage, the environment, care for the elderly. And tonight we're taking on the big one. It's health care as voted for by you. Each of the programmes has centred on the issues you told us were the most important to you at both a local constituency and island wide level. That was from an online survey. The subject was at the uh, was a resounding concern for the majority of people who took part at a local level. More than 42% of people said this was their biggest concern. And at a national one, this figure rose to 55%. And the survey on the whole had uh, nearly 800 responses in total. So what do we mean by health care? People are living longer. Obesity, we're told, is on the rise. The pressures on the hospital, GP services, even pharmacies are higher than ever. Things we hear daily in the news. Last week, in fact, we heard of a projected overspend from the Department of Health and Social Care of £5.4 million and the need for more funds from Treasury. The Sir Jonathan Michael report over six months ago now, that was in May, proposed a radical overhaul of the whole system, which we're told is well underway now. Well, to help me understand some of these issues, and it will just have to be some of them because we are restricted on time, of course, this evening, I do have an expert panel with me consisting of the uh, Minister for Health and Social Care, David Ashford, the Director of Public Health, Dr Henrietta Hewitt, and the Positive Action Group's Roger Tomlinson. Well, welcome to you all and thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening, Alex. Well, to start then, in the thick of it, if we, if we can, I'd like to put the same question to all of you. So, Mr Tomlinson, perhaps, uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge to healthcare in the Isle of Man at the moment? Well, first of all, Alex, I'm not an expert. I'm a member of the public, so that's how I sit here and mm-hmm. give my views. Um, as far as healthcare on the Isle of Man is concerned, what interests me is public health because that's a long-term issue and generally we th- when we th- talk about health we're talking about much shorter time horizons so for me it's public health and that's not just because Dr Hewitt is sitting alongside me I genuinely feel that we should be more putting more resources into public health. Are there, so is that because of the wider issues that I mentioned before people are living longer of course treatment on the whole is improving How is public health changing? Is this something that's changing every day or is it a kind of slow progression, a cultural shift? Uh, We need a cultural shift and we need a cross-government and beyond shift in how we think about risk factors for our health. Um, The greatest burden of avoidable ill health and indeed mortality is currently smoking, but only just because we've managed to get our smoking rates well under control. And at 11%, we're significantly lower than England, which is great news. But the bit where we're not doing so well is in overweight and obesity. And overweight and obesity is the biggest avoidable risk factor we have for a lot of conditions, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease and stroke, and a number of common cancers. Where does this obesity rise, it seems, stem from? How are we tackling it? How can we be tackling it better? Yeah, it is what we know as a wicked problem. Pretty much everybody in our population knows the basic rules for healthy diet and for taking exercise, but we don't put them into practice. And I would say that that's as true probably for me and people like me as it is for those who are struggling on lower incomes and have more stresses in their life and therefore it's more difficult for them. We live in what is often referred to as an obesogenic environment. Ultra processed, high fat, high salt, high sugar food is cheap. It's much cheaper to buy a thousand calories of junk food than it is to buy a thousand calories of fruit and veg and unprocessed food. So if you're struggling on a low income, it's, you know, as it would seem, a no brainer to buy the cheaper food because you can get the food on the table. You don't even have to cook it in many cases, just warm it up. But actually, that food is not healthy food. And when you combine that with the reduction in opportunities just to be active as part of our daily lives, you know, we get in the car to make very short journeys when years back we would have walked or got on a bike. And unless we tackle all of that so that people are living healthier lives almost without having to think about it, 
And that means changing the environment so that active travel is easier and healthy diet is easier. You mentioned active travel, of course, and that does take us on to government somewhat. I mean, how much, though, is it's changing people's attitudes the biggest challenge? What is the biggest pressure which that you know is affecting I, I on the whole they, department? I, I think they all actually feed into one. I mean, when, when you talk about what is the biggest challenge, I'd say it's multifaceted. So, for instance, um, from my point of view as health minister, one of the biggest challenges is we have got an ageing population, but we also currently have a healthcare system that is reactive rather than actually preventative and that's what we need to get to so most of our healthcare system at the moment is based around acute care acute care by its very nature is something that has already happened and we need to start building up such as public health and also what we're doing out in the community to try and be more preventative around health care. So it all interlinks. And in relation to the obesity, which we've just been talking about, there was, of course, the children's weight management strategy that went out for consultation. There was 118 published responses. Obviously, there were some that were private as well where people didn't want their response published. Um, but it had a very good result. Um, those are now all being filtered through since the results were published in October to bring forward a strategy to be able to tackle this but it most definitely is cultural and it's around teaching people what um, and trying to educate them about what is best but as Henrietta has just rightly said it does feed in as well around needing to change the situation where it is cheaper to be able to buy the junk food than it is to buy the fruit and veg. I'm sure many people will be sat at home nodding their heads, of course, yes, we want to be more proactive, let's not be reactive. What are you actually doing at the moment to be more pre- preventative? So one of the things we're doing is we're trying to move functions away from the acute environment, so things such as diabetes care, along with others, which where I think we have the only real over the years centralised diabetes care up at the hospital that's becoming more of a community service there is starting to be investment in the community side to get more things on the ground we're running the Peel pilot project which is bringing all the agencies together so and also a lot of the Sir Jonathan Michael review the first seven work streams are now up and running that all feeds into prevention rather than actually trying to do things after the fact we've got Alex It's up to the government as well to get their act together because it seems to me that these various initiatives, and you mentioned active travel, come from different parts of government. It seems, uh, I think the active travel, I don't know if it comes from Department of Infrastructure or Treasury, or, and I just feel that all these loose ends need to be tied together to give uh, a coordinated approach. Just to give Roger some reassurance on that, active travel um, is actually driven from the centre. The, act- uh, the active travel working group involves cross-government, so it's got DOI on, it's got DHSC on, it's got the Cabinet Office on, it's got all the different agencies, education as well. So that is one where it is being driven by the centre rather than just giving it to one department because I quite agree with you that's where things go wrong when we run a silo mentality because that's Mm. one of the things I'm trying to break down in health is this silo mentality. Well there's one issue that cropped up last week in Tinwald and is close to my heart because I live in Laxey and that's the EU water bathing directive and that seems to me to come from the Department of uh, Environment, Food and Agriculture and in a in the report that Tinwald approved, there's one small paragraph about public health. Now, I would have thought that that initiative should have been pushed by public health because I don't think what we've what Tinwald agreed on last week is good enough, quite honestly. And I wondered if Dr Ewart had any thoughts on that. I haven't actually been cited on that at all. But that said, environmental health, which does sit within the Department of um, Environment, Fisheries and Agriculture, do have the lead for that. And that would be the same across. Now, we do actually work with environmental health colleagues, but there is a separation in functions and they do what they do best and we do what we do best. Is this highlighting something quite common is that people don't really understand who's doing Mm. what and people aren't being communicated that information clearly enough I would agree and that's that's the point I'm trying to make let's get a coordinated government working on these issues as we saw last week in the election uh, in the UK uh, the the health service and health issues figure topmost apart from Brexit that is
Well, well, just one thing to say. I mean, this is a lot more coordinated approach going on around government than there ever has been on the island. So lots of things like, for instance, you had a panel discussion recently on um, care for the elderly and the ageing population. That is actually being driven from the centre. It involves DHSC. It, invo it involves other government agencies as well. It involves different departments. It's driven centrally by the Minister for Policy and Reform to make sure it has a centralist approach. Equally, the Sir Jonathan Michael review hasn't just involved the Department for health and social care again the minister for policy and reforms involved in that so is treasury um, and it's cross-government could you be publishing more of your updates about where you are with that report it was publicized very heavily at the time it was released and these seven stages mean a lot to you i'm sure but for many people that's just a, a, a buzzwords isn't it so is there some kind of communication you could be publishing to people there will be um coming the new year there will start being regular public updates at the moment we've been getting the transformation team in place we've been working up the different work streams because obviously there's 26 recommendations to implement they can't all be done at once because some of them flow off other recommendations so we've had to identify the first seven work streams and there will then be quarter at least quarterly updates that the public will be able to see and there'll also be an annual report to Tim Wood as well that's a very good point you make because trying to do some background research knowing that I was coming here tonight, uh, I did look on the DHSC website and, and I keyed in Sir Jonathan Michael report. I couldn't find it. I don't know if it's there or not. It is. It's just off the main landing page. It's also got its own, um, it's also got its own, if I remember rightly, it's got its own section as well within the website. But I do agree, but we agree on that, Roger. I think at the moment the government website is very difficult to navigate. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Well, if we move on slightly then, because there are some major issues that came out of this survey which uh, regarded some of the things I don't think it will surprise any of you, which is staffing and waiting lists, two of the biggest bugbears, if I can put it that way, for people. If I uh, put some comments to you, perhaps, uh, Minister Ashford, uh, healthcare, ongoing serious mistakes and blunders at Nobles Hospital, which are covered up and ignored, long waiting lists for hospital and GP appointments and pre procedures, stress doctors and nurses, it needs serious attention, but no change in many years. Uh, another or oh, uh, survey respondents said Nobles Hospital, especially when the cardiac department is a disgrace, it took 17 months to get the result of a tillet test when we had to demand it ourselves. Can you get your reaction well, to that? Well, obviously I can't comment on an individual case because I'm not aware of that particular one and obviously different people have different experiences. But, the but one I think thing it's I would say fairly anecdotal, relation... isn't it, that 18 months is, uh, we hear this all the time, people are waiting a year or 18 months. Well, one months. of the things I would point out in relation to waiting lists is it's quite interesting because I had a piece of analysis work undertaken as to where we are on waiting times compared to if we were across in the UK. So, for instance, if you look at general surgery, our average time waiting for first appointments, this is wait for your first appointment, would be 12 weeks. In the UK, it's 26. Gynecology, our wait for first appointment is five weeks. The Just UK because something's better than the, the UK no, no, no. doesn't mean it's good enough. No, it doesn't. And that's one of the things. But one of the things that always gets cited is, of course, in the UK, they have the 18-week treatment to referral target. Well, one of the things we are working towards that, but one of the things I've pointed out is that's all well and good as long as you meet it and one of the things in the UK is they're not meeting so some things we're better on some things we're worse on so dermatology for instance is an area we need to concentrate on because we're way out of kilter even with the UK but in terms of waiting times it's not actually as bad as the, the performance and waiting times are on the 21st of October 2019 update, uh, the 93% of patients referred to hospital with suspected cancer seen within two weeks uh, worsened by 9.6 percentage points. That's fairly significant. Well, there was one particular reason for that, which was in one particular cancer specialty where the consultant actually to cleave and the locum consultant that we had booked um, declined to eventually take up the role. So we had a period where we were left without a consultant, so they had to then play catch up with the clinics. How many locum staff do you have at the moment? So across the board, there's a wide variety. It differs. Um, but one of the things I need to say about recruitment as well is recruitment over the last 12 months has actually been improving quite dramatically, particularly in hard to recruit to posts. So, for instance, just over the last 12 months, we've, we've employed three consultant geriatricians, um, two consultants in acute medicine. Um, consultant anaesthetist, consultant in renal medicine. So we're at, and we've got 
interviews on the 17th um, for the consultant cardiologist. Post. And, and these are full time. And posts, these are full time posts. So we are slowly filling vacancies, but it has been a slow process because like with the UK, where there is a shortage, um, for instance, the UK at the moment, 12 percent of all nursing jobs are vacant. We have to be able to recruit. Well, Mr. Thomson, if I just flip back to you slightly, as somebody that is regularly involved in public meetings about various issues, how often do these kind of issues surrounding healthcare crop up? Well, we continually are being asked by members of our group uh, to raise certain issues. And I must say that the health service doesn't figure very highly in that list, although it does figure on the list. Um, and of course, as it's such a big subject it's really difficult to target in on something that will appeal to the general public but one that did appeal recently in the last few months was the introduction of 5g and there i'm sorry to say that dr hewitt wouldn't engage with that meeting and actually appear so uh, i just feel very disappointed and let down by that because there were 150 people in that room and we could have got the message about 5G across very well. Well, Dr. Ewart, we have I'm spoken very happy to you. To respond to that now, as I understand it, Positive Action Group doesn't actually organise those meetings because all the correspondence I had on that was with a group calling itself 5G Aware IOM. Um, they declined to provide me with background information on who they were, what their aims and objectives were, or even what the agenda for the meeting was going to be. And I'm not prepared to stand up in that manner. Um, I previously refused to appear at a positive action group sponsored or hosted on behalf of an anti-vaccination campaigner for pretty much the same reasons. I have had very protracted correspondences with individuals involved with 5G Aware and indeed with emails that came from the group itself. And I've responded in fine detail to the claims they make about their so-called experts and have indicated why their arguments do not stand up. Now, if I was being offered a formal debate scenario, I would happily have taken part, as I did in one about medicinal cannabis for one of the business groups recently, because in that scenario, one knows exactly who is going to be involved and exactly what the format is going to be. But having seen how both the anti-vaccination individual and the 5G Aware group operate, they seem to use a technique that in the States is known as fire hosing. Um, here, I think, historically, we've talked about it as scattergunning. They just throw at you millions of bits of stuff. You know, here's a video of this. Tell me what you think of it. Um, here's a paper on this without giving you the time to actually prepare your own argument or indeed without them having prepared an argument. Can I, can I just say, I've seen the correspondence Public Health has had with 5G Aware and lots of other individuals as well. And Henrietta has gone into great detail in going through point by point. In relation to the public meeting, um, I, as minister, because I, I felt it, you know, it was a political, more political role as well. I, um, I did offer to attend it. Um, but as I pointed out to the organisers, I couldn't attend on the date in question because I was down at Westminster at the time. And I offered five other dates on which I could attend if they, if they wanted to reschedule. Um, but they went ahead on the date in question. Well, certainly with 5G uh, debates we've had here on Manx Radio, I know, Dr. Hewitt, you have spoken to us and we have spoken mm -hmm. to 5G Aware IOM. So if anyone is interested on both your party lines on that, they can find that on the Manx Radio website. But I shall try shift the subject slightly because, of course, we are limited to time. And uh, it's one example, I suppose, of how broad and massive this subject is. But one other area which we I think we must touch on, of course, is mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of comments, again, we had from this. Mental health services, this is one respondent, uh, are appalling on the island where many of the people are going in and out of prison have serious mental health issues and drug and alcohol services uh, are wildly underfunded and understaffed. Uh, a response to that? One of the issues is we have seen rise in demand across all the services of health and particularly mental health. One of the key things with mental health is, from my point of view, early intervention because if you don't get that early intervention, then problems are just going to get worse and worse. So there has been investment in the last couple of years How into much? mental health. Um, from memory, I think it was three million we put into additional funding for mental health. Um, 
you know, there's particularly there's been investment around the children's mental health because, again, if you don't deal with the problem early, it just builds up as they become an adult, um, which has seen some waiting list initiatives to try and bring those down as well. But demand keeps outstripping we, what we, did we can t- we provide. We both talk about that. I spoke to you this last November, you so uh, and, oh, over a year ago now about this topic. And I must say it's the same sort of messages coming out again. It has to be preventative, early intervention. Yeah, and that is what we're working towards. So, so what exactly has happened? So like I say we've got more we've got more staff in the mental health division there's more mental health support we've actually put investment in to allow there to be more people able to be seen but as I say we are continuously getting that rise in demand in the background as well and we've got to try and keep pace for that and unfortunately um, you know we're going to have to look at the way the services are structured because it's not a never-ending pot of money so we are going to have to look at the way we deliver services across the island. With the recent overspend, uh, projected overspend number that was uh, 5.4 mm-hmm. million, uh, this is a, it's, it may be no surprise that the Department of Health and Social Care has regularly had overspends. It's needed to ask for more money. Why is this just increasing pressure? We hear this in here. Why isn't the department getting enough to deal with it better the next time around? Well, there's, se- there's several factors there, which is actually this year it's switched slightly because the pressure demand this year has actually been on costs of patient care. So, for instance, we've got the tertiary, which is the off-island spend with partner hospitals that has gone up by several million, several million over budget. Um, we also have seen an increase in endoscopies. So we've had to provide um, more, um, more endoscopy services because obviously they're feeder services then for other areas so it's flipped slightly compared to what the overspend has been on in previous years and also we just mentioned mental health off island mental health placements is about a million pounds overspent currently as well so it's a different type of overspend this year but also it's in line with what sir jonathan was predicting in his report he pointed out that the department unless we make the changes necessary to make it more community focused to make it more preventative would see four percent year on year increase in costs and the amount of the overspend being predicted is within that four percent category what is the timeline for that just so the jonathan michael report to right. be fully implemented well well people talk about this is the thing people talk about full implementation and if you look at the 26 recommendations there's not a point in time where you stop it's a service that should be continuously reviewing itself and going forward. The key point is to get Manx Care up and running. So the legislation for that will be taken through next year so we can create the shadow organisation of Manx Care so that can be set to live in April 2021. Well, we are coming to the end of this uh, very quickly already, I'm afraid. So I'd just quite like to uh, finish by asking you all the same question once again, really. Uh, So perhaps if we start with Dr. Yu at this time, uh, what are you most optimistic about in the future of healthcare in the Isle of Man? Well, public health is not really about healthcare. So I don't particularly want to answer that. What I am optimistic about on public health terms, which is about prevention and getting to the causes of the causes, is that we are seeing much more openness to a cross-government dialogue about that, which is excellent because DHSC actually does not operate much in that space and shouldn't do. Um, and actually broadening it into that wider determinants of health debate and response is the thing I'm most encouraged about. Mr Tomlinson? I want to tell you about my New Year's resolution. That's when I go on the bus or I go on the aeroplane or I go on the ferry, I've got to talk to somebody because I think that's a very good contributor to mental health, both my own and probably, I hope, the person I'm talking to. So I think we've got to talk to each other a lot more, just as I was indicating that perhaps Dr Ewart should have spoken to Positive Action Group. She's an excellent communicator and uh, I think we've got to talk to each other a lot more. Well, it was what were my most po- what am I most positive and enthused by, and that is the transformation that's coming in the healthcare service. The report that Sir Jonathan's done and the twenty six recommendations gives us a unique opportunity to do things differently, and to actually make the make a massive change to the way we deliver healthcare on the island. Well, thank you very much. We are going to have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. This has been the fourth and final What Matters Most live panel programme. Thank you to my guests, Minister David Ashford, Director of Public Health, Dr Henrietta Ewan and Roger Thomason from the Positive Action Group, appearing, of course, as a member of the public today. And uh, thank you for your company this evening.